Welcome to the Wealth Matters Podcast, where investors come together to better understand how to build passive cash flow and create generational wealth without all the confusing mumbo jumbo. Here's your host and co author of Amazon number one bestseller, Alpesh Pamar. Welcome to Wealth Matters Podcast. I have Mr. Daniel Weisfeld with me. How are you, Daniel? Doing great, Alpesh. Thanks for having me on the show. Absolutely. So Daniel has a JD and MBA, as well as he worked as a diplomat. But I want to figure out how did he got from being a diplomat and moved into mobile home park space. So I'm looking forward to this episode. And also Daniel focuses on Western US, or I should say the more expensive markets where I don't even look for any kind of real estate opportunities. So I really want to learn how he, he and his team does this. So Daniel, welcome again. Thanks for having me. Yes, absolutely. So tell us something interesting or funny about yourself. Okay. Um, I love cold water. Most oh, people hate cold water. Most people, you can't pay them enough money to jump in cold water. And I love it. It gives me energy. It makes me feel really healthy. So on Sunday, we, we live in the Bay Area. And I uh-huh. took my wife and our two kids to the Golden Gate Bridge. And our plan was to walk across the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, but when I saw the water, I decided to actually forget the plan of going across the Golden Gate Bridge. I want to jump in the water. So we parked the car. And I was swimming around in the bay at like 50 degrees for 12 minutes. And Ooh. I feel totally invigorated. And then I was able to walk with energy. That is amazing, man. I wish I could do that. And, 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 and I, I don't want to take this podcast to another, uh, you know, sidetrack it. But I love cold showers. So, and, and so I, I follow Wim Hof method. I don't know if you, you know follow Wim Hof. Hof. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I bought his course. I met him. Uh, three years wow. ago in San Francisco. Uh, wow. So, yeah. <laughs> but but so I, I need to I'm learn from you. There. <laughs> no. so, so, look, I know you don't want to sidetrack, but let me ask you. Has, <laughs> so for the viewers who don't know, Wim Hof method is a method of breathing and cold water to create energy yes. in the body. So right. I'm curious, has that helped you with your um, real estate investing, with focus, with your professional aspirations, or is it more personal for you? I, I think it's it's both, definitely. So what I did, and I never spoke on the podcast about this, but um, I combined Wim Hof with my Miracle Morning routine, right? So as soon as I wake woke up, I'll, you know, get started with my breathing, right? Every morning, that's part of my Miracle Morning. I'll go through the breathing, then I'll work out, then I'll get on the shower, right? So I'm already mm-hmm hot and warmed up and now I got to you know cool myself down so it works out really well and I could definitely tell not only uh, personal side but physically I feel so much better right because I work out every day and yes uh, it I have a lot more focus now uh, than I had three years ago wow so I highly recommend it wow I so sometime maybe not on this podcast I'd love to hear more about your miracle morning I'm sure. trying to, I'm, right now I'm working on my morning routine and trying to figure out what's the perfect pattern. So I'd love to talk to you about that. Yeah, yeah, we should catch up. You know, I love about cold uh, water. So I need to touch that with you as well. <laughs> okay, great. We'll make a date. We'll go to the bay. We'll dunk into 50 degree water. And that's when we'll talk uh, about our morning. <laughs> <laughs> let's see, Let, let's do it. So let's great. jump back into real estate. When sure. and how did you start investing in real estate? So I'm fortunate. I come from an immigrant family that came to America with nothing, like so many of us and probably your right. listeners. Yes. And my grandfather was the entrepreneur who came here with nothing, worked as a car mechanic, saved money fixing cars. Eventually he rented the garage, then eventually he bought a garage. And then eventually around 1980, he bought a mobile home park. So I had wow. some family background in mobile that home parks. As, as a kid, I would go nice. help my grandfather in the body shop fixing cars and then I'd help him go to his mobile home park to mow the lawn, paint the fence, take out the garbage. You know, he was really a hands-on owner operator. Nice. Um, and he was, you know, didn't have a lot of education but he was a very hardworking entrepreneur and he saved money from the park and bought another one, saved money, bought another one. So my family actually acquired a portfolio of 12 parks on the West Coast. 
um, which they really operated nice. really as mom and pop operators. My my grandfather and my aunt were running it out of their living room. Um, <laughs> you know, not you know. Nowadays, I joke that I'm trying to buy parks from mom and pop operators. So that was my family. Yes, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, I went off. I didn't think that's what I wanted to do when I grew up. Right? I to me it was trailer parks, not sexy, not interesting. I, I wanted to change the world. So I went to college. I worked as a US diplomat. I got a law degree. I got an MBA. I worked in the corporate world. So I did other things. And it was really in 2017, uh, I was ready to leave the corporate job. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And I saw the opportunity in manufactured housing. Got it. So so the, that is going to be my next question as well. How did you go from being an EL graduate and US diplomat to managing a portfolio of mobile home communities? But I think now it does make sense. But was that transition easier because you already or your family already had a history uh, with mobile home parks or? Um... Yeah, so, so I mean, I'll, let me, I'll share some more light on the thought process. Um, it wasn't obvious to me that I was going to leave my high paying job at McKinsey and go do mobile home parks. It was more like I wanted to leave McKinsey and I realized I wanted to invest in real estate because real estate, I realized you can provide something really positive in the world, which is housing that people need. Yes. And I think it's the best, the single best way to build long-term wealth. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. no so, doubt. So I knew I wanted to leave McKinsey and do real estate. Um, but even then, I did like 50 job interviews in real estate. I interviewed with developers. I thought I wanted to build apartment buildings. Then I interviewed with single family guys. Then I was, I was really trying to figure out the strategy. And it was finally, I was talking to all these people doing all these job interviews. And I finally mentioned that my family did some mobile home parks and they were all like, what? what? Your family does mobile <laughs> home parks? Why are you talking to me? Go do mobile home parks. That's the yeah, best business. Yeah, exactly. so I finally, finally realized after a long journey that this thing that had always been staring me in the face, I never, yeah. I never saw it. it was right in front of my eyes. And I finally realized, you know, this is a great asset class and I have, I can start with a running start, right? I have a, I have a leg up because my family had some history in this space. Right. Oh, that's awesome. So what was your own first MHC uh, deal and how did it work out? So the first deal we did actually has a funny story. Um, our portfolio now is focused in the Western US. Okay. Um, but the first deal we did was in the Eastern US. Um, oh. My business partner is my wife's brother. And okay. I live in the Bay Area in California. He lives in Boston. Is that a good um, thing to do? <laughs> no, just... I don't recommend it to anybody. I would not recommend it, but it, like logically it doesn't make sense. But in our case, Thank God it really works out. We, first of all, we love each other and we trust each other deeply. Right, Second right. of all, we have completely opposite skills. Like okay. he's a CPA, he's a finance and operations guy. He always sees the details. And I'm like big picture of strategy. Let's grow, 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 okay. grow. And so kind of we have that tension and we get to the right decisions. Got it. Yeah, my brother-in-law lives in New Jersey. That's why I asked. Oh, <laughs> yeah, don't, don't do business with him. <laughs> So anyways, you're asking about our first deal. He's my partner is based in Boston. His wife crashed her car and he needed to find a new car. So he was looking online at the police auction websites where he can get a, a good deal on cars. So looking at Toyota Camry, Honda Civic, you know, Ford yeah. Taurus scrolling down. And then he sees mobile home park for sale on the police auction website. Oh yeah. Personal property. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, so turns out there was a, it's, it's in Western New York state. It's a town called Horseheads, New York. Okay. Um, the starting auction price was like $50,000. It was 20 units owned by a total slumlord who neglected it. Um, you know, didn't pave the roads, didn't do any repairs, didn't pay his property tax bills. And eventually it got repossessed. Um, so we made a bid and we won it for a hundred thousand dollars, which is for, for 20 units. So, you know, 5,000 bucks a door. Wow. Uh, yeah. And we said, uh Oh, we won. We didn't think we were going to win. So we said, where are we going to find a hundred thousand dollars? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now, you know, I snap my fingers and I have investors that will give that to me in a minute. But at right. the time it's like, where are we going to get a hundred thousand dollars? So our first deal, we literally went to our best friends from growing up, our cousins, my aunt, the people we knew the best and said, everyone put in $10,000 a piece and let's buy this park. And we bought it right. two years ago. We've totally turned it around. We got rid of the drug dealers, got rid of the problem tenants. We've created a really good 
community that our residents are proud to live in. It's very affordable. And we're on the path to turn it around. And our goal is actually to sell this one to the residents. Nice, nice. Yeah. So you still own it, right? We still own it. Yeah. And it, it's not our core business. We don't want to own small assets in Western New York, right. you know, more focused strategy. So we're, we're on the path to sell it in the next, few, in the next year or two. Okay, so now uh, let's talk about the markets. How and why did you choose Western US when everyone is running from it, right? That's because, and I, I connect with you because I live in Bay Area and yeah. I do not invest in California ever. I, I did not and I don't wanna. So, but of course I see a lot of mobile phone parks here too. And I'm always thinking, should I, would it work if I buy one here? So how did you end up focusing on Western US when everyone says, oh, go out of state, go far away and invest. So Alpesh, let's have the debate, all right? It's, it's gonna be the smackdown, <laughs> East versus West, and we'll see who wins, okay? So here's what I'm seeing in the mobile home park space. If you go online, any of the chat rooms or bigger pockets or LinkedIn, you're seeing people who learn mobile home parks is a great asset class. It's recession proof cash flow. We want to we want to get yield, and so we're going to go buy in the Midwest and the Southeast. That's what most investors are doing. Even if you live in San Francisco or New York, you're probably buying in the Midwest or the Southeast. That's the trend right. um, because people want yield, and in those markets, you can still buy it. You know seven, eight caps, maybe nine caps if you get lucky. And, you know, you get a value add deal where you do that value add, um, you know, you can hit 20% IRRs or higher. You know, I have friends who are doing deals with even 30, 40% IRRs, like crazy returns. Um, that's very different from our model. Our model, we're focused in the Western US. Our core states are California, Oregon, Washington, Idaho, Arizona. Um, cap rates in our markets, are typically kind of in the four to five percent range. Four to five, yeah, exactly. Yeah, for for, for quality institutional assets, it's below a four cap. It's yes. kind of the three and a half cap range. Um, typically, I'm seeing stuff in kind of the mid four cap range, like four and a half cap, and rougher assets, kind of class C stuff, smaller parks, and maybe five and a half caps. Yes. Okay. With with no vacancy upside, they are typically 100 percent occupied. Rents right. are typically close <laughs> to market. So our once we, when we put on leverage, when we put on debt, kind of the deal level returns are typically in the 10% to 15% range. Okay. And if, okay. So why do I like that business? You're probably, maybe you're laughing at me. You're like, this guy's yeah. a sucker. Why does he want a 10% IRR when I can get a 30% IRR in Mississippi? Right. I love my business. All right. I love my business because in my markets, housing demand is so much greater than the available supply. We are 100% occupied always. I've never seen a vacancy. I don't know what a vacancy is. Never seen right. one. I don't have vacancy upside because I'm in zero vacancy markets. Um, and my tenants deeply value the opportunity to live in my parks because there's no other cheap alternatives. Right. So, so for them to, so they are highly bought in. They obey park rules. They keep their place looking nice. They have equity in their home, which they value. And so from a, rules enforcement and a, and a park appearance perspective, my parks are better. And then finally, if you look at my tenant profile, um, I'm typically not serving kind of the lowest income demographic. Like, you know, lot rent in my markets is call it 500 to $800. A you kind of, you know, used homes in my parks trade for 30,000 to $60,000. Wow, okay. There are people who have you know, and new homes in my park sell for 90,000 to 150,000. Um, so these yeah. are people who have some income, they have some wealth and they have the ability to withstand economic shocks. So during 08, 09, our parks did great. During COVID now I'm at 96% rent collections. You know, I'm dealing with people who are in the workforce and have us, you know, they're not middle-class but they're not the lowest economic. No, okay, yeah, yeah. It's they are not the Walmart employees. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so they're, they're, it's a very resilient return profile. And so we get recession-proof cash flow, and we're we're really happy with it. Got it. Okay, no, I, I think that does make sense. But um, just thinking about again California, and um, what about the eviction moratorium and overall land law? I mean, tenant-friendly laws in California. So look, the way I think about it is, over the past fifty years, California has had the most rent growth and the most housing price growth of any market in the US. Yes. Right? 
because of population growth and structural undersupply of housing. This market is structurally undersupplied. And so if you, as a landlord, you want to access that appreciation and that strength of a market, you got to pay to play. You got to deal with very tenant friendly laws. That's the, reg that's the regulatory environment here. Um, and so for us, we've learned how to navigate that environment, right? We have lawyers who advise us. We learn how to comply with the rules. The eviction process is not easy. I wish it was right. easier. Like, I don't want to put people out on the street, but it's, I wish it was easier to evict people who are violating rules, violating the yes. law. I wish that was easier. But it's the price I pay in order to operate in a market where there is such deep demand for affordable housing and not enough supply, and we're always occupied with consistent rent growth. Got it. Oh, yeah, I, I agree. So then what is your acquisition strategy uh, when you are acquiring this uh, parks? Like, what, what do you look for? So we pride ourselves on being flexible and creative mobile home park investors. And what I mean, what I mean by that is we have a wide box. So okay. we will do all ages and we'll do 55 and up. We'll do beautiful class A parks, you know, swimming pool, tennis court, and we'll pay mm -hmm. a four cap or less. And we'll do rough turnaround mm -hmm. class C parks. We'll do city utilities or we'll do, you know, private well, private septic. We pride ourselves on being, um, you know, canny investors, sophisticated investors who look at the merits of each deal and look at kind of right. make a return a decision based on the merits of every deal. Hmm. So how do you make this investment work when it's very hard to have the property cash flow? Um, how do you, because it's so, four so cap. I, so I would how push you, you, I would push you, Alpesh. <laughs> Alpesh, how do you define cash flow? What do you mean? You mean you mean 0%, you mean 2%, you mean 20%? That's a, that's a good question. Uh, I feel like I want to see a uh, six to 8% cash on cash return um, when the property is cash flowing, right? That's, okay. that's my investment criteria. And as uh, everyone has their own criteria yeah. and risk profile. Yeah. So <clears throat> most of our deals do that. Oh, okay. Okay. Like, I mean, typically, you know, let's say we're buying at a four or a five cap, you know, four to five cap range, you know, as, as you know, and as your invest, as your investors know, there is really attractive debt available for mobile home parks. Yes. So typically right. putting on you know, <laughs> Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac debt at, you know, three and a half percent interest only fixed, right. fixed rate for 10 years. Um, and so levered yield starting on day one is typically five to 6% starting okay. on day one for a stabilized uh -huh. asset. And then it grows from there as we increase NOI. Got it. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. And, and just to, um, and again, I'm trying to understand, let's say an asset you acquired for 10 million in California and it has park owned home of homes also, right? So now your levered um, value play is much lower because Fannie and Freddie would not finance park owned homes, right? So how so, do you work that out? So there's actually um, a real regional distinction around park owned homes. Okay. Um, when we're buying parks on the West Coast, we almost never see park-owned homes. Oh, okay. Very rare. Um, in the Southeast, you see a lot of park-owned homes. You see some yes. parks that are 100% park-owned homes. Yeah, because right? I don't think they can afford the homes. <laughs> exactly. So I am a snob about park-owned homes. Ah, okay. I'm a snob, okay? I operate in, in good markets in the Western US where my tenants, they're not rich, they're not living in the Ritz-Carlton, but you have two people in the household are in the workforce. Typical household income is call it, you know, 40,000 to 60 or 70,000 in the household and they can afford to buy a home. And that is the tenant I want. I want tenants who own their own home. They have skin in the game. They stick around for a long time. My, my, my target tenant is not someone who's going to pay $400 a month to rent a 1960 single wide you renovated five times. And, um, they are vulnerable to economic shock. They're not able to absorb a lot of rent increases. And you may have eviction issues with that demographic um, if they're not in the workforce and they're spending a lot of time during the day in the park. We've had those issues before. Um, and if, and they leave after six months or 12 months because they're a renter and then you have to renovate the unit. Right. That, that's not my core business. Okay, so that's part of one of your investment criteria and then that as low number of park owned homes as possible then, right? Pretty much. I mean, okay. we, we'll, we will buy a park with maybe up to 20% park owned homes. 
uh, with a plan to convert them to tenant owned homes. Right. But honestly, in our markets in the Western US, we very rarely see deals that have park owned homes. We look at deals sometimes in Texas or other markets that have them, and then we think about what's the plan to convert them. Got it. And do you, uh, if you have to convert them, do you do owner financing or lease to own? Um, we've done both. Okay. We yeah, have both programs in place. We, yeah. uh, I mean, one of us, the program, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. It's, uh, we have to be careful about Dodd Frank as well. Right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So how do you navigate that? So um, if you're going to originate a loan, under Dodd Frank, you you need to be a licensed mortgage loan originator. Right. <laughs> I am not personally a licensed mortgage originator, so we have partnered with an MLO oh, okay. loan okay. originator who Got does it. the loan origination and servicing. We act as the bank. We provide the capital and we set the underwriting criteria. Oh. But we have a party do the loan origination and servicing. So you have for more us like servicer, yeah, on Got a fee it. basis, okay. yeah. Oh, okay. um, so that's what we do when we do loans, um, and then. We also, you, you can do a lease with option to purchase, lease, which, lease is to structure, own, yes. which does not require you to have a mortgage loan. Got it. Um, but just, you know, your listeners should be careful that, in, um, you know, state regulators are looking to make sure that if you do a lease with an option to purchase, they want to make sure it's really a lease with an option to purchase. Right. And it's not a mortgage loan masquerading as a lease with an option to purchase. Right. And, and, and I one know of the people try to do use, that. <laughs> yeah. And one of the tests they use for that is they look at, what is the dollar amount of the option payment okay. and as a percentage of the home value? And if it's 5% or 10%, they say, okay, that's a reasonable option amount. But if it's 30% of the home value, they would say, no, 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 that, that's not an option. That's a down payment. And this is really a loan with a down payment. And so, uh. so that's something to keep in mind. And for that reason, we as the landlord prefer to do an actual loan because that allows us to take a 20 or 30% down payment, which gives us more security. And when you're in the lease with option to purchase land, you know, you can only really take 10, up to 10% of the, of the value right. of the home before you get into a potential gray area. I see. And, and, and then you are still stuck with that uh, home for a while, right? Whereas, yeah. you know, when you get a good down payment, you almost cover your expenses for the home, right? <laughs> for yeah, it, it, for used homes, yeah, I think that's true. Yes, yeah, Again, for, this, not this for depends new on homes. your market. Yeah, yeah, yeah. New yeah. homes definitely would be much yeah. more expensive. Okay, yeah. now, um, one more question about this market. So, um, any gotchas to keep in mind while investing in this kind of expensive or unaffordable markets? <laughs> I'll finish. I'll answer it, but first I want to flip the question on you, man. Because for me, <laughs> like people ask me, what are the gotchas for me as a new mobile home park investor? What are the things to look out for? And for me, I, you know, the big gotcha is don't go chase yield and invest in a declining market because uh, right. you're because you can get a park at an eight cap. I think people sometimes forget the first rule of real estate is location, 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 location. 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 Yeah. Right, that's the first three rules of real estate. Yep. And I think people fall in love with the mobile home park asset class because it's a great asset class. And then they're, they're willing to go buy in really remote fringe markets where you have, you know, like in the Rust Belt and other places where you have negative population growth and towns that right. are dying, industries that are dying. That's not where I want to invest. I don't care if you're buying it. It's priced at an eight cap or a 10 cap for a reason. For a reason, um, yep. And so I feel much more comfortable buying in strong markets with jobs growth and population growth, growing housing demand, long-term rent growth, and buying at a, at a five cap. That feels really comfortable to me. So, I mean, so I would say watch out for the marginal markets. And if you're buying in, a, in kind of markets where I tend to buy, um, the gotchas would be, make sure you understand the regulatory environment. Make yes. sure you understand that, yeah, it might take you six months to evict a tenant who's not complying with park rules. And look out about what are the current uh, moratoria that are in place on evictions during COVID and look out for rent control, right? I operate in Oregon, which has statewide rent control. Yes, they enacted it last, last where year, where you, right? Yeah, exactly, it was passed, I think, yeah, I think in 2019. A year before, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. and in California, you know, I might be researching a deal in a 
mobile home, you know, mobile home park deal in Southern California. And I say, oh, this deal looks great. And the rents are way below market. And then I Google it. Well, yeah, there's rent control and the rents, you're only allowed to raise the rent at CPI. Right. So yeah. you need to look out for those gotchas. No, that's a, that's a great point. That's, uh, yeah, other than eviction, the rent control is here to stay. So, yeah, you yeah. got to be very careful. Thank you for yeah. that. What has been your best mobile home park deal so far? Look, my deals are like my children. I can't pick a favorite <laughs> deal. <laughs> but if I had to pick one, yeah. uh, Renton Highland Manor in Renton, Washington. Okay. Um, Renton I is, know Renton. I, uh, Pat Carr is there. I used to travel there, actually. So I, yeah, Pat Carr, which is a truck manufacturer. Yes, yes. So it was one of my IT clients. So I was there like in 2015 or 16. Yeah. Okay, great. So you know the market. So yes. for, for, for the folks who don't know, Renton borders Seattle. Yes, it's um, right there. It has historically been kind of, you know, an affordable outlying area next to Seattle with a, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of racial diversity and um, you know, kind of dem- demographic diversity um, and a wide variety of industries, right? You've got manufacturing there, you've got healthcare, yep. you've got Boeing, um, all sorts of industries. And we bought a mobile home park there. It was one of the first deals we did in 2017, um, which the market saw it as a dog, okay? It, it was ugly. It was a class C park. It was built in the 40s high density, tiny lots, all single wide homes. People are stacked on top of each other. The roads were unpaved, potholes in the roads. I went there with my wife and she said, Daniel, this looks like a shanty town. Like in Brazil where people live like in favelas on the hillside, kind right. of you know, houses they made themselves. Like she said, that, that's what this looks like. Yeah, you know, people had, bay, bay back in Asia too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It looked like a shanty town, like where people like took like wood that they found and added onto their homes. So, you know, this is not a deal where we can get institutional financing, right? Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are going to, you know, run if they see this right. deal. Um, and, mo- and the market didn't value it very highly. It kind of saw it, like I said, as a really rough asset. And we saw it as a diamond in the rough. I mean, we looked at the demographics of Seattle and Renton and the population growth that's happened there and the, the rise in housing prices and the lack of affordable housing. And this is, you know, yes, yeah, what our acquisition criteria. I said, we tried to look deal by deal. There's a deal where we said, the economics are great. These are all families are in the workforce. They need a place to live. In-place rents were, I think, four ninety five dollars when we bought it. And this is a market where if you want to rent a studio apartment, you're going to be spending $1,500 for a studio. Wow, wow. You know, and, yeah. and a two-bedroom apartment is going to cost you more than $2,000. So, yeah. you know, $495 lot rents, like, we said, wow. yes, please, <laughs> let's buy this asset. We bought it. And I feel good about this, both on the social side and the financial side. Socially, we cleaned it up. We made this a great community for our residents. We put up a new sign, we put up new lighting, we paved the roads. We, we showed people, this is a place you can be proud of. We helped them paint their homes, haul out the trash, bring in brand new manufactured homes. So we've really repositioned the community. And financially, um, we refinanced it this past summer in 2020, I think two and a half years after buying it. Um, you know, I think we bought it, rough numbers don't quote me, but I think we bought it for three and a quarter million. And two years later, it appraised at five and a half million. Nice. Um, we refinanced out our entire purchase price. Right. Return capital yeah. to our investors. You know, our long-term plan is to own it, hold it forever. And, you know, it's a deal I'm really proud of. Well, that's awesome. Hey, so one question there. When you mentioned that you want to own it forever, so are your investors still in the deal? And are they open to be in the deal for long-term? Long-term. Yes. So... This is my whole business model, and it's based on my personal philosophy and my family experience. So I mentioned at the beginning, my family immigrated to the U.S. with nothing. My my grandfather was fixing cars, and gradually they built real wealth in America. I'm very grateful for the opportunities in this country, right? They're they're very comfortable. Right. Um, And the way we did that as a family was we buy great assets and we hold them forever. And... I'm not interested in buying great assets and selling them. Like it's, it's very hard to find good mobile home parks. Once I find it, I'm investing a ton of work to improve it and, and make it a good asset. So then why would I sell it? Especially when there's such a great liquid market for refinancing, right? It's easy to pull out your, your equity through a refi 
and then you, then you can retain it the asset you know for decades generationally so that's that's what i want to do i'm kind of weird that way Mo most syndicators and most gps right. you know are looking for five year period or maybe seven maybe a 10 year fund life yeah. i tell my investors my whole our whole value proposition is we want to build you wealth over decades. We want to build wealth generationally. So we're going to buy assets. You know, we'll typically return invested capital between year seven and year 10 through refinancing. And that's how we kind of, we pull out the invested capital and then we stay in the deal forever and we harvest cash flow forever. Got and it. it's funny that, that that's not normal. It's how most people work, but it seems to me like that when I talk to people, most people say, yeah, that makes sense. That, that's, that aligns with my goals for most of my investors. They're really happy to have that opportunity. Got it. Okay. And um, how, how about uh, you? Just, what's, what's your typical model? Yes. Yeah, so uh, the typical model, you know, I'm all over the place depending on the deal. Right. Okay. So that are uh, like my last one, of course, all my investors, uh, they kept asking me what's the uh, model and, and I'm planning to do the same model on my last mobile or, the, or my first mobile home park deal, which I did last year is that pretty much uh, pull out and entire equity uh, around year five or so and then just stay in the deal. And in that particular um, scenario, of course, my investors and um, wanted to do that as well. And they want to have, actually, they want to have all the exit options. And this is one of the options they definitely like if they, if I return all of that invested capital, right? And they re can redeploy. But my earlier deals, of course, I always try to sell between three to five years and, and um, so that, you know, I can go on on another deal. Uh, but, you know, it, it, it depends. Uh, it goes deal by deal. Mm -hmm. Do you regret it? Do you regret selling your deals? <laughs> Good. For some deals, yeah. Some deals I'm happy that I sold. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? Like one of my deal, my wife keeps going, because that was my property here in Bay Area. She keeps complaining, why did you sell it? You know, because <laughs> yeah. everything, done. and my other yeah. deals, I'm like, okay, I sold at right time. And I got out, like I sold a couple of properties in Dallas in 2019. Mm -hmm. and like it was perfect timing, um, you know, because um, the taxes are going up. Of course, people are moving there, but the rents were not keeping up. So, mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's a mixed feeling. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So, can you share your if you have any worst deal or um, so far, and what did you learn from it? You know what? I'm going to tell you something that I've never said before on a podcast or in like a public forum. Okay. Typically, we will ask you about my worst deal. I talk about a deal we did in outside Seattle, not the Renton deal, but a different one. Okay. But I, Alpesh, because you've been making the pitch for mobile home parks in um, kind of out there markets like, like Mississippi, I'm going to say my worst deal was the deal we bought in Western New York State. Okay. The one that I mentioned earlier. Right. Uh, first one. Yeah. And the reason it's the worst deal is, you know, a small remote market without a lot of population growth, you know, in place rents at that park were like probably. $250, $300, and that's, kind of, that's market in that area. Oh, wow, okay. You're listening to the Wealth Matters Podcast. The Wealth Matters Podcast. For more info about what we do, check us out at wealthmatters.com. It's wealth, W-E-A-L-T-H, matters, M-A-T-R-S, dot com. Yeah. So as I was saying, we bought in this... Um, small market, declining population, in place rents were roughly $300. And never again, I'd never do a deal like that again. Um, I have vacancy in that park. I don't know about what in my in my in the West Coast, I don't know what vacancy is. I've never seen a vacancy. Here I have vacancy, we have turnover, we have tenants who trash the place. And then we have, we spend more money fixing the home and renovating it when we turn the units than we make on space rent from from the tenant. It's just like, the economics on that deal are upside down for me. So the, the takeaway was I'd rather invest in better markets uh, with hot, kind of higher lot rents because you get more dollars per unit of effort as a GP um, and with um, tenant to really bought in as homeowners. That was my takeaway. Got it. Awesome. No, it, it does make sense. And um, you, you are not, you got me thinking now that I should look into, you know, Western market as well. <laughs> Think about it. Yeah, no, I, I will. 
So um, let's, uh, Daniel, are you ready for fire round? Fire round, yeah, sure. Okay. Would you be changing any business or investment strategy after coronavirus? Yes, buy more mobile home parks. They have done so well during Corona. I want more of them. That's awesome. Favorite real estate or finance or any other related book? I don't read about real estate or finance. I read fiction. I try to expand <laughs> my mind to, to, to get creative ideas. So I say read fiction that you enjoy. That's better than reading about business. Oh, that's awesome. Any tool or website you recommend or you cannot live without? LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn a lot. Yeah, it's created a lot of opportunities for me. <laughs> that's where we connected. So yeah. I can tell. Any advice for beginner investors? Go do a deal. Don't sit around too long. Don't study too much. Don't spend, don't pay for too many seminars. If you're interested, go buy a deal. See how it goes. That's a great advice. And this is what I keep telling all my friends and listeners that Unless you do a deal, you are not going to learn. It's, you can learn as much as you want on bigger pockets, LinkedIn, read as many books. But if you don't open up that heart, uh, you know, st stomach and do a surgery, you are not going to learn, right? So exactly. uh, that's, that's really important. How do you give back? For me, my work is giving back. So I, I don't think about my work and then separately I do charity or something in the community. For me, we're trying to build a values-driven business that creates you know, great communities for our 8,000 residents to live in. And that in itself is creating kind of a major positive impact in this world. How can my listeners switch out to you? ThreePillarCommunities.com is my website. Spelled out T-H-R-E-E, -E, PillarCommunities.com. And you'll see a little button on the upper right to join our mailing list. Feel free to join or shoot me an email. I'd love to chat. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Daniel. And just to remind uh, listeners that both of us are in Bay Area and we had over 70 mile per hour winds. And so both of us have had lots of difficulties today recording this slash, um, podcast. And I, I really appreciate Daniel for hanging in. Thank you, Alpesh. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And I look forward to following up with you to go for our cold water swim in yes, the bay. We got to do that. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for listening to the Wealth Matters podcast. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a five-star rating on iTunes so others can enjoy the show too. Have a great week and happy investing.